Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm sure you've noticed if you've had me before that I sound a little bit different than most people. Some might say that I sound a little prettier, uh, but the reason I sound different, as, as well most of you guys know, is I'm not originally from America, I'm from England. So I have an accent, and my accent over the last decade in the US has got me into some quite strange situations over the years, ranging from the bizarre to the just straight up annoying. Uh, and one of the most frustrating for me was when I was in college and I first moved over, uh, I pretty much lived off fast food, so I would go to drive throughs and they would not understand anything that I would say to them. So I would pull up uh, into a McDonald's, a Wendy's, Taco Bell, you name it, and every single one of them, all the time it was the same. I would say, hey, can I get a burger, fries, a Coke? And they say, honey, I don't understand a word you're saying. You're gonna have to go around. And I would have this everywhere I went. Uh, so I thought, well, maybe, maybe I could simplify this. Maybe I won't tell them what I want. I'll tell them the number of the meal. So I would drive up, I'd say, can I get an eight? And they'd say, honey, I know you want to eat. What do you want to eat? <laughs> and it would just go on and on. No matter what I did, they wouldn't quite catch it. And it, it got really embarrassing because I would drive to the second window and there would be like a team of McDonald's employees kind of looking at me like this. <laughs> And it, I was just like, I can't do this. I want to eat unhealthy in peace, please. So uh, I decided what I needed to do is I needed to get myself an American accent. I needed to learn how to talk the talk so that they could understand me. So I imagined up my best American accent, drove up to the window, and I said, could I get a burger and a Coke and some fries, please? <laughs> An instant victory. They never, even, they never even thought twice. It was pretty good, right? That was good. Um, so finally, I could eat unhealthy in peace. There was nothing in my way anymore. It was great. But that little funny story is not unlike what we're looking at in the Bible today. Because as we continue this series, we're going to be looking at a teaching about Jesus, something that's really, really important to who he is, which is a story about how he talked the talk, how he became like us so that we could see him, so that we could understand him, and so that he could accomplish something really important. If this is your first week here with us in this series, or if you've missed the last couple of weeks, uh, we have been going through the book of Hebrews, which is a letter in the New Testament. And the series is called Jesus is Greater because this series is all about how Jesus is bigger and better than all of the other things in this world. We have been told so far in this book that Jesus is greater than the universe, that he was there in the beginning, that he was the one by whom God created everything. He's the greatest communication from God to us because he's the exact imprint of his nature and the radiance of his glory. Just last week we heard how he is greater than the angels, that he stands apart from them. He's not just one other religious figure or spiritual figure amongst many, but he is the greatest, he is the king. And this has been done because this letter was being written to a group of Christians who were suffering some pretty difficult things. You see, this was written probably around 50 to 60 years after Jesus had lived, and towards the end of that century, when these people lived, to be a Christian was a very unpopular thing. Other well, governments of the day, the Roman authorities, and other religions, the Jewish community, did not like Christians. And the hostility had been building slowly until it was reaching a critical point where now emperors were calling for mass persecution of Christians. They were being accused of things that they did not commit, and their very lives were on the line. And so in comes the book of Hebrews, this letter written to the community. And we don't know who wrote it. It could be a him, it could be a her. All we know is that he wrote into this terrible situation and he told them Jesus is greater. Jesus is bigger and better than the things that you are facing. Jesus is so much greater than the trials and the pains that you are facing. And when we pick up today, we're picking up in chapter two where after we've just heard the author go on and on about how great Jesus is, how he's above everything, that he's greater than the angels, things take a little bit of a sharp turn and all of a sudden we're told that this Jesus, who is greater than angels for a time, became lower than the angels. That the greater became lesser. He lowered himself beneath the angels that he had made. So if you guys want to read with me, let's go ahead and read chapter 2, verses 5 through 9 to begin with. This is what Hebrews says. It says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the well to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? 
Now I wanna pause real quickly, just for a second, because whenever we see that phrase, son of man, it's, it might seem a little odd to us, but to people reading this, they would have read that as Jesus, because Jesus referred to himself as the son of man. It was this messianic title, this important name that the Old Testament had taught would belong to God's savior. And so whenever they read son of man, and whenever we read son of man in the New Testament, we should see it as a pointer towards Jesus. So this is what he goes on to say about Jesus. You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he let nothing outside of his control. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So as I said, this is a story about the great are becoming lesser. This is a little bit of a teaching on what we call in Christianity the incarnation, the teaching that God became man, that he took on flesh and became one of us, that he became like us. How many of you here have heard of a guy called Mike Rowe? Anybody? A few, a little bit less than fair service. So Mike Rowe, this is Mike Rowe here. He is the presenter of a show called Dirty Jobs. Now Dirty Jobs is all about Mike going into these different situations and these different professions that nobody wants to get involved with and he becomes like them. He takes on that job for the duration of the show and uh, he gets involved in some quite messy situations. He has been a sewage inspector in San Francisco. Uh, he has been a snake wrangler a shark suit tester, uh, he has worked at a water treatment plant, uh, all manner of things quite gross and disgusting that we wouldn't want to get involved with. Uh, but what's interesting about this is he, he goes into these situations and he doesn't just interview the people who do it day in and day out, he becomes one of them, he joins them in whatever their profession is. And what's really interesting is that Mike didn't start out as someone involved in these jobs. It's not someone who already worked in a trade or already worked in a messy job and wanted to go and be with other people like him. Mike actually started out as an opera singer and he got involved in doing this because he wanted to go and be a part of what they were doing. Now, that's not unlike what Jesus did for us because the incarnation is a little bit of a dirty job. It's God coming and putting himself in the midst of a broken and hurting world, and not just coming and seeing what we do, but joining us, joining us in living a human life and going through everything that goes along with that. And this is one of the most important things in Christianity. This is the way John, one of Jesus' disciples, wrote about this idea in his gospel. He says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the story of the Almighty becoming lowly, the majestic becoming humble. This is the story of God stooping and lowering himself to do something for us. And here's why this is so important. Firstly, it teaches us about how much he loves us. If we do away with the incarnation or we ignore the idea that God became a man, we lose some of the insight we have into just how great God's love is for us. You see, God coming to be with us is about giving us his presence, being physically present with us. Now, I can appreciate this quite a bit because I'm very, very far from most of my family. A lot of my family still live in England, and so every birthday and every Christmas, they will send gifts over for me, but I'll find myself wishing I would rather have them with me. I really like the gifts I get for Christmas and my birthday, but I would rather have my family be present with me. And I think we can all relate to that a little bit because we all prefer to be with the ones that we love. We don't wanna love from a distance, we wanna love up close, and it's the same with God. You see, many, many people in these days, and even today, think of God as being what we call transcendent or above everything, outside of our world, that maybe there's a God out there, but he doesn't get himself involved with what we do. But that's the complete contrary of what the gospel message is and what Christianity teaches. And in fact, today, maybe you don't even believe in God, maybe you don't call yourself a Christian, and I think probably you would have better eyes to understand this or appreciate it than many of us who've grown up in church our whole lives, because this is kind of Christianity 101 for people who've been in church their whole lives, and we forget just how important and how dramatic this is. Because when we look at Jesus, when we look at God becoming man, we see a God who wants to be right next to us, who wants to stand shoulder to shoulder with us, who doesn't love from a distance, but loves up close. 
It also tells us a little bit about what God is like. We were told in chapter one of Hebrews in verse three that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. So Jesus is the perfect picture of who God is. When we see Jesus, we see God. When we see the way that Jesus reacts in situations or treats people, we are seeing God move. So this is kind of a, a glimpse into the kind of character and the personality of God because when we see a God who's willing to give up majesty and come and be close to lowly broken people, we know that that is the kind of thing that God does. That this isn't just Jesus doing something different, that he is God himself in the flesh and so he is loving the least of these. And so that's how we know that God loves the least of these because he physically came and did it. The last thing that we learn about this is that we learn that God is willing to suffer with us, which is massively important. Because again, sometimes we get stuck in this root of thinking that God is above everything and he, he kind of challenges us and says, hey, you just need to have more faith. You need to get things done. You need to see me and trust me and stop mourning and, and whining. But that's not what God is like. God is a God who's willing to come and suffer with us. He doesn't judge us from a distance, but comes up close. He relates himself to the things that we go through. You see, when God became a man, he didn't just come in some kind of illusion and look like a man. He really became a man. He was born. He had to grow up. He had to learn. He had to go through the awkwardness of being a teenager. He got tired. He got hungry. He was betrayed by his friends. His family ridiculed him on occasion. For a time in his life, Jesus was homeless on his ministry, so he went through unimaginable things. He went through the whole human experience. He probably felt everything in this room collective that we, that we have all felt. And that tells us that God is willing to suffer with us, that he's willing to be right next to us when we go through what we go through. For instance, if you have a really bad day and you were to pick up a phone to God, he wouldn't berate you on how you should have had more faith. He would say, I know, I understand what life is like. That's incredible. And Christianity stands alone in this teaching that God would do that, that God would be willing to suffer, that he doesn't excuse himself from pain and hardship, but comes and joins us in the midst of it. And when the time this letter was written, there was a small crowd and it actually went on for a while that people really, really struggled with this. They couldn't believe that God would really become a man, that really he would go through all of these different things. That it couldn't be possible that a God would suffer. So they would say, well, maybe it just looked that way. Maybe it was a kind of an illusion that God came and was with us, but he didn't really become a man. He didn't really suffer on the cross because God couldn't possibly suffer. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what Hebrews teaches us. It tells us that he became like us in every way, that he came and he lived a life just like us. He even died a death like us. But is the incarnation nothing but an example? Do we look at it and say, well, that's great. It shows us that he loves us and it shows us what he's like, but does it do anything more than that? Well, the writer of Hebrews seems to think so. He seems to think that this accomplishes something very, very specific. This is what he says in verse 10 through 15. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. Again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil, and destroy all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. You may have noticed recently, if you were into uh, bizarre fringe trivia, that there is a new oldest person in the world. Uh, very recently, the, uh, the former oldest person in the world passed away just in August. Her name was Jeanne Calment, and she reached the verified age of 122 years and 164 days. So she was almost halfway, if not halfway, to 123. Uh, so this is pretty incredible. She was replaced by a lady in Haiti named Violet Brown, who is currently over 117 years young. Um, this obviously tells us women live longer than men, which is no surprise. 
Uh, but this is fascinating, isn't it? When we hear these stories, they, they appear in the news because it's incredible. When we find someone who's managed to live this long, most of us don't reach that age, and we're fascinated by longevity and trying to prolong life, and it's been that way since day one with human beings. If you look at ancient myths and mythologies, they've always got some story about how to avoid death or escape death. And even today, we dedicate so much science and so much hard work towards prolonging life and avoiding death. We've got incredible new vaccinations and wonderful life-giving drugs that help us put off death for a little bit longer. But it doesn't matter which generation you were born into, it doesn't matter where you come from, we still have not defeated the problem of death. There is no one who will ultimately avoid the problem of death. It's gonna come for us all. And I like to think of death as the great thief because death comes for us, for us all and it steals from us, it takes from us everything that we've poured our heart and soul into for our entire lives. Everything that we build one day is gonna end and go away. And that can be very, very intimidating, that can be heartbreaking, to know that none of us can escape this terrifying thing. But the Bible has something to say about this. It tells us a lot about the idea of death. And the first thing it tells us is that there is one who has the power of death, and that's Satan. Now if the idea of the incarnation and God becoming a man doesn't weird you out a little bit, I'm sure that talking about Satan does, because in our culture, uh, we're a little bit skeptical, even in churches, of the idea of the devil or of Satan. He's a little laughable. In pop culture, we see pictures of him and ideas of him that are just a little silly and a little ridiculous. But the Bible's presentation of Satan is that he is a very real and very dangerous enemy, and he holds the power of death. There's a lot that we don't understand about Satan, quite frankly, because he's not as important as God, and that's why the Bible doesn't take much time to talk about him. But what we do know about Satan is that he is a created being. He's not like God. He's not the opposite of God. He is a created being. He's an angel. Just like we are created by God, so was he. And Satan hated God and wanted to take God's place. He wanted to be on the throne. He wanted to be God himself. And even the idea, we look at that or read about that and we think, well, that's, that's laughable. It's like something out of a, a movie or a, a fantasy book. That's not real. But if we're honest, it's not too different than most human beings. Most of us would like to replace God. Most of us would like to tell God the way that we want it run or the way that we like it to work. So although it is somewhat laughable in our culture to talk about the devil this way, I don't think it's completely irrational. I think it's actually quite believable. And what happened is that Satan came to God's first children, Adam and Eve, and he deceived them, and he basically invited them to believe exactly what he believed. He deceived them and told them that God doesn't really care about them, that he's actually trying to hold them back, and that the only reason he would tell them not to do something is because he knows if they really did it, they would get to be in God's place. And so Adam and Eve bought that lie, and as soon as they did, death came into the world. Because as soon as we try and replace God and move God to the side, then we have removed the author of life himself from the picture of life, and from the picture of reality. And when we lose the author of life, it is inevitable that death is gonna come in. So that's what happened. This deceiver, this enemy, this one who hates God and hates everything that God loves came and manipulated and deceived and caused us to think that we could be better than God. And death ended the world. But there's good news in the Bible. The Bible has something else to say about Satan, and it says this, that the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. It says that in 1 John 3, 8. If you have seen the movie Troy, uh, how many of you have seen Troy? Oh, still not enough, there's, there's no hands going on. It's a great movie. Troy is this fantastic movie about uh, a book called the Iliad. Uh, it's a really, really old book uh, about the Greek hero Achilles. And if you're anything like me, you don't want to read the book because the book is about this big. So you go see the movie, and it's got Brad Pitt with his uh, blonde highlights, which was all the rage in ancient Greece, apparently. Um, and you see this movie, and the movie opens with two armies coming together. Uh, and you've got an army from Thessaly, an army from a larger area of Greece. They come together, and two kings come into the middle, and they say to each other, why don't we just have our greatest champion from each army fight? Rather than waste all of our men, rather than waste all of our resources in a battle that's gonna last all day, we'll each choose one champion to face each other. 
Uh, and so that's what they do. And the winner of this battle, this one-on-one -on -one battle, will decide the ultimate winner of the, the overall battle. Uh, and so the king of Thessaly sends in this guy, Boagrius, this huge tower of a man, covered in scars, huge shield, huge spear. Uh, and the king of Greece sends in Brad Pitt, sends in Achilles. Now I'm gonna pause on that. We'll find out what happens in a second. But whenever we read this passage in verse 10, it called Jesus something interesting. It called him the founder of our salvation. Now, if we looked at this in Greek, we could maybe appreciate what founder of salvation means a little bit better because the Greek word for founder there is a Greek word, archegos. And what that word means is captain or champion. It means kind of a forerunner or a representative who goes ahead. So what it's telling us is that Jesus... God in the flesh is our champion of salvation. He is our representative. He, in effect, is our representative, just like Achilles who goes out into battle for us. And this is not unlike what happens in the Old Testament with David and Goliath either. If you remember that story, it was the same scenario. Two armies, the Israelite army and the Philistine army, and two men come into the middle, Goliath and David. So we see this story. We've got Achilles and Boagrius. We've got David and Goliath these forerunners, these champions of their respective nations and armies coming to face each other. And so Jesus, our champion, he goes out on behalf of us. And in this movie, what's brilliant about the scene is Achilles charges at Boagrius, and Boagrius, even though he is twice as large as Achilles, even though he's wearing more armor, even though he is far more intimidating, Achilles leaps up in the air and with no effort at all, puts Boagrius down on the ground. It's a great scene. If you love action movies, it's epic. But it's epic in another way for us Christians because it is a picture of Jesus dealing with the adversary of death, dealing with the one who has the power of death, which is Satan, because he is our champion. He is the one whom God sent to be like us, to be our representative, to face death on our behalf. And so just like David went down into that valley to face Goliath while the Israelite army stands cowering on the hill, Jesus goes down into the valley to face death while we all stand afraid of it. And when death tried to swallow Jesus, when death tried to end Jesus, it choked on him. It couldn't handle him, it couldn't keep him in the grave because Jesus is the conqueror of death. He is the champion that defeated death See, if death was a predator that tried to eat Jesus, Jesus took out its teeth. And in the end, now it can't do anything. For those who trust in Jesus, death can no longer be the great thief. It can't take from us. All death can do is deliver us into the arms of a waiting savior. Jesus has once and for all put to death by death, as we sing in the old hymn. And this is great news. But it's not the only great news in Jesus becoming man. It's not the only thing that he did for us. He didn't just fight for us. He wasn't just a champion for us. He did something else. This is how today's passage closes in verses 16 through 18. It says that surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So there's probably a word in there that was a little confusing to you, which we'll look at in a second. But he's basically telling us that Jesus became a man to become a priest, to become a merciful and faithful high priest for us. And whenever we talk about a priest, it's gonna bring with it this idea that we don't like to talk about very often, that makes us uncomfortable, and it's the idea of sin because that's what a priest was there to deal with. He was there to deal with sin. You see, sin is the problem behind the problem. If the problem of death is out there and we're afraid of it and we have to face it and Jesus has to defeat it, then first of all, he has to defeat sin because death entered the world because of sin. And if we're all honest, even if we don't like talking about sin and it makes us uncomfortable, I think most of us can admit that we know what it is. We feel it deep down in our guts. Even if you don't believe in God, even if you're an irreligious person, you can feel the weight of the bad mistakes in your life. You can feel the weight of things that you know hurt other people, things that you did that you know were selfish or cruel. Everyone deals with regret. We are all in the same boat in that respect. And so in some ways, we shouldn't really be that afraid to talk about sin because it's a shared condition. It's something we all deal with. It doesn't matter what it is. Every single one of us have some of it somewhere in our life. And Jesus comes to deal with it as a priest. Now, 
God has a response to sin, which is equally as uncomfortable to talk about, but it's very, very important. See, God has an emotional response to sin, and he has an ethical responsibility to sin as well. And those two things make us uncomfortable. Firstly, because his emotional response to sin is that he's angry about it. God is angry about sin. And now, I don't like talking about that. I wish we could do another sermon about how God gets really excited and happy about something. But I think if we are willing for a moment to pause and reflect on this idea of God being angry about sin, we'll find that there is good news wrapped up in it. That it's actually not something that should terrify us. It's something that should point us towards God's great love. And let me try and explain a little bit why. When we see things in the world that are broken or wrong or unjust, we get angry about them. When I saw white supremacists march in Charlottesville a few weeks ago, I was angry about that because it was wrong. When I see refugees and children from Syria, I get angry about that because it's wrong. When I read newspaper headlines about people suffering and in pain, I get angry about it because it should not happen. It's unjust, it's unfair, it's cruel, it's evil. And why do I get angry about them? And I'm willing to bet most of you get angry about those things because we care about people, because we love people, because we don't like to see people suffering and hurting. We don't like to see these horrible situations, so we get angry. And that is exactly why God gets angry about sin. You see, sin is damage on a cosmic scale. Sin is something that we can't fully understand and appreciate from our perspective, but God can because God is greater. He sees the ramifications of our decisions. He understands the consequences of the choices we make in ways that we will never, ever be able to understand. And he tells us that when we avoid him, when we turn against him, when we leave his side, then that is sin, that is damaging, that is hurtful and cruel. And because God is good, we should trust his judgment in that. So it is actually a good thing that God gets angry about sin because it points us to how much he cares about people. The second thing is he has an ethical responsibility to it. Let me try and explain this with a little bit of analogy. If I took Pastor Jeff's car for a spin after church today and I got a little too excited and got into a wreck, there's one of only two things that can happen in order to fix that situation. Either I pay for the damage that I've caused to his car or Jeff has to pay for the damage. Those are the only two things that can happen. We could ignore it, but then the damage doesn't get put right. The car is just damaged. There's nothing we can do about it. Someone is gonna have to pay for it. And when we see things that are wrong in the world, when we see things that are unjust, we all of us say deep inside of ourselves, someone has to pay for that. Someone has to pay for when children are cast out of their homes. Someone has to pay for when people are cruel to one another. And we're right. Someone does have to pay, either us or God. See, we talk in church about forgiveness being free, and it is, for us, but not for God. See, this passage is telling us what God chose to do about sin, what he chose to do about this problem, and what he did is he stepped into our world as a man to become a faithful high priest. And just like in that analogy, I told you that one of the two of us is, after, is gonna have to pay for the damage to Jeff's car, either me or Jeff. One of the two of us is gonna have to pay for sin, either me Oh God, so God comes and he becomes like me so that he can take on my debt. And what he does is he says, I forgive you, but the damage still has to be put right, so I will take on the cost of it. I'll become a man, I'll become a faithful high priest so that I can take on the cost of your sin, so that I can cover your sin. And that's what propitiation is, that word that we read a moment ago that can be a little confusing. It is a word to articulate and describe to us that God came as a man so that he could cover our guilt, so that he could pay our debt, so that he could turn away the anger of God by resolving the problem of sin, by removing it from us. As far as the east is from the west, we're told. There is no better news. That's why what the Bible teaches is called the gospel, the good news, because it is a story about God stepping into human life, taking on suffering so that he can remove burdens from us, so that he can remove the pain that we feel deep inside, the brokenness that we feel, the guilt and the shame that we feel. I wanna finish by just telling you a story a little bit about myself that's a little embarrassing to tell. I feel a lot better about it the more I tell it, but it's still a difficult story. Uh, last year, I started to see a doctor about anxiety and depression. 
And that was really embarrassing for me because I like to be seen as the, the happy guy who feels good about everything all the time. And this was actually a problem that I'd been dealing with for a very, very long time. But because I was embarrassed about it, because I felt like I had no reason to be depressed or anxious, I just went ahead and I buried it. I didn't talk about it. I didn't want to talk to anybody else because as a guy, you feel weak when you have to talk about those things. So I just tried to do away with it. Now that is not unlike what we do with our sin. Whenever we feel that gnawing sense of brokenness inside of ourselves, when we feel regret, when we feel guilt, when we feel shame, we don't want to bring it to God because we feel like he won't understand it, that he will judge us, that he will be angry with us, and so we bury it deep down inside and pretend like it's not there. And again, even if you're not a Christian and you don't believe in God, I'm willing to bet that you can at least relate somewhat when I talk about this idea of burying down those things that you don't want to deal with. What happened for me was I went to a conference in England, uh, or in Scotland, sorry, uh, and uh, I was thinking about this and dealing with this. No one knew about it, and uh, someone started teaching on the Bible, and for some reason, to this day, I don't know why, they started talking about anxiety and depression, and they started talking about how they dealt with it. This was a Bible teacher. This was someone doing what I wanted to do, but felt like I couldn't because of my anxiety and depression, and he talked about how God had helped him with it. He talked about how God understood it, and for the first time, I felt like someone truly understood what I was going through, because the way he talked about it, the way that he explained what he felt was exactly the way I was feeling. And when you find someone who understands the way that you feel about something that's very painful, it's like water in the desert, just to know that someone understands, well, Jesus understands. Jesus understands the problem of sin because he became a man and he was tempted just like us. He struggled just like us. But he didn't just stop there. He didn't just understand. He went to the cross to propitiate our sin. He went as our merciful and faithful high priest, the one who goes on our behalf to deal with it, to get rid of it, to remove it from us. I don't, I don't think that you could dream up a more loving God than that a God who's willing to step into brokenness, into a world that hates him and rejects him, that doesn't want him to come in and absorb our debt on himself, to walk to a very painful cross, to die a very painful death so that we can be made right with God. So he's, he's what we need to take away from this. This morning, we need to look at Jesus and try and have some fresh eyes, and we need to see that God in Jesus is the God that comes and stands shoulder to shoulder with us to get rid of our burdens, to get rid of the brokenness in our lives, to get rid of our great enemy. That's who he is. If you are like me this morning and you have something buried down deep that you don't wanna deal with or you feel like you can't bring to God, I wanna promise you that there is no better place from you, for you than the throne of grace to go to Jesus and he will set you free. He will take off your shoulders this burden of sin that you're carrying, this fear of death that you're carrying, and he will deal with it once and for all. The incarnation of Jesus Christ proves that God doesn't want you to carry your burden. He wants to carry it for you. And if we will trust in him, if we will look to him like the author of Hebrews tells us to do again and again, we'll find a hope and a joy that we will not find anywhere else. Would you guys pray with me this morning? Father, I thank you for your son. I thank you for his greatness and his goodness. I thank you for all the things that he shows us about you by becoming a man, by coming in the flesh. And God, I pray that we would never fail to see the shock and awe of him doing that. Lord, you remind us that you came as a man to be our priest, to be our champion, to take the burdens off our shoulders, to deal with the problems of sin and death and sin. God, you are good, and there is no better place to be found. You are water in the desert. We love you, and we pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we finish this morning, I do want you to quickly leave this idea of God willing to take your burdens, that he wants to stand shoulder to shoulder with you, that he wants to carry your sin because that's really important. And I know we, we always have this drive when we get to the end of church to try and run out, but if there's anything that we can pray for you, if you want to talk to someone, if you need encouragement, please come let us know. But let's finish with today's benediction. Let's go in the name of the God who chose to become one of us, to stand in solidarity with us, 
to defeat death and sin and Satan because of his undying devotion to his people. It's in the name of Jesus that we go. Amen.